Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Fuller Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a very special guest. Everyone is a special guest to me, but this one is especially special. I'm joined by Professor Professor Roger Smith. Now, you know, I've learned a lot uh, at Mason, especially um, from my fellow faculty members and staff members. But Roger is, he's just a wealth of knowledge, particularly for just the media, the media game. So, Um, I had him on the podcast, uh, particularly to talk about podcasting, which is so interesting and all those things. But before I do that, I want Roger to just give a little bit of uh, intro about who he is. I am an instructor. I have a dual role here at George Mason. I am an instructor in the Department of Communication, teaching 3-3 or basically 18 credits every year in radio in media management. That's one of my favorite classes to teach, especially now. Uh, And I also teach sports in the media, and I teach a podcasting class. And I teach uh, three to six credits yearly of writing across the media. That's half of my identity. The other half is to be faculty advisor for WGMURadio.com, which is one of the many student-run and student-led groups within student media through university life. We have a paid staff of students dedicated to producing content and programming and leading the online radio station for George Mason University for student media. I serve as uh, an advisor on uh, policies and procedures, but the students take care of the day-to-day decisions. I've been at George Mason for 26 years, been very fortunate Uh, to be teaching some great students over the years. Uh, One that went on to become uh, president of the student student press club. Uh, I've had others who uh, I've watched. I've had mornings where I will watch one channel and see a former news, a former student being a news anchor, change it to the other channel to watch somebody do weather, change it to another (laughs) channel to find somebody doing a movie review. So, Just through all that, in spite of me, uh, these students uh, succeed uh, beyond their wildest dreams. I'm very proud to have uh, had a small part in their matriculation towards a career in media. Now, you forgot the best part of that intro. Uh, The best part of that intro is our shared shared identity as fellow Duke dogs. Go jam you. Um, And so... uh, I always connected, we gravitated. You've been really helpful. Uh, You said, um, particularly in your intro, how you helped students for over 20 something years at Mason uh, in regards to starting their careers in media. But let's, you know, dial it back for you. You have made a career yourself in media and radio. Can you uh, just go back to the beginnings, the humble beginnings of Roger, uh, uh, how you got interested in radio yourself? This was actually in high school. We had a student broadcasting club, Warren County High School in Front Royal, Virginia. One hour per week, we would be able to uh, program uh, and play music and highlight what's happening at Warren County High School. Uh, The call letters were WFFV, and the studio was actually next to the uh, gift shop in (laughs) Wayside Inn, in Middletown, Virginia, there was this window where people could see the DJ working while they walked through mm-hmm. the uh, gift shop. But we had a one hour per week, and I remember interviewing uh, the tennis coach on the team winning the uh, district title. So we would play music, but we'd also highlight mm-hmm. Warren County. And eventually I became a, uh, uh, an on-air personality. If uh, the listener is uh, in tune with local stations, at 92.5 WINC, the part of the morning crew is Barry Lee. He was the program director there in the early 80s who gave me a chance to be on the air. Mm-hmm. As I've always said, uh, he put me on the air on Sunday morning at 6, to uh, thinking that I would be making some mistakes. Well, I always exceeded his expectations by making <laughs> a ton of mistakes. Yes, and I that's it. why I was on Sunday morning at 6. But he gave me that opportunity, and that's part of the reason why I'm here. 
went to James Madison, studied uh, something called communication arts, which is now called media arts and design. Yeah. Was, was that SMAD, now SMAD major? It's now SMAD, a yeah. student of School of Media Arts and Design in uh, Johnson Hall. Mm -hmm. I went on to work in my hometown uh, radio station in Front Royal for six and a half years, morning drive. I can tell you a story about the morning of the Kuwait invasion in 1991. Mm -hmm. That was such yeah. a tense environment, but I do remember that was just an amazing moment of my uh, broadcast career. I eventually wrote commercials for another radio station in mm -hmm. Winchester, earned a master's in business administration from Shenandoah University in Winchester. 1994, I applied for this job, which was really two part-time jobs. It yeah. was being an adjunct and advising both, but it was a 50% pay increase over what I was ever making yeah. in previous jobs. So that's how I wound up uh, at George Mason. Eventually it became a uh, full-time in 99. So I've been working and teaching here since 1994, but I've had this radio background that really started in high school. Not too many yeah. people had that opportunity, and those opportunities are, are few and far between now. So I'm yeah. very lucky where I got in at that time. So, you know, transitioning for yourself, you know, going from a practitioner to educator, uh, I mean, you spoke upon a little bit about like maybe the pay increase, but what was some of that drive to switch from just staying in radio yourself or you know, becoming the guru that you are and passing on that knowledge to the to the next generation. You mean the transition from a professional broadcaster to education? Is that what you're Yeah, yeah. What was, and then like, and what, what why did Foster? Because, you know, you could have stayed in your lane and just done like progress for yourself. But now you're like, you transition to more like, I'm going to educate and help students. Like, what was that drive to do that and stick with that and maybe make that full solid transition? For yourself. The, the, the idea was I had done just about everything I wanted to do in radio. Mm -hmm. I've been an on-air personality. I was working in morning drive, which is basically 5 to 9 a.m., six days a week, Monday through Saturday. I had been a production director, in other words, writing and producing commercials. I mm -hmm. had done sales, not well, but I did that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I thought, well, the only other thing I haven't done is to teach this. And mm -hmm. I still have the ad from the Washington Post. <laughs> Okay. asking for candidates for these two positions. I told my wife, I can't do this job. This is basically two part-time jobs. Well, you ought to try it. I mean, you might be able to get that. Yeah. That's the only job in my entire life where I didn't know anybody on the other side of that interviewing table and I got okay. the job. I had to know somebody else to get a job mixing cement or yeah. other things. I knew somebody in my geography class to get a radio job mm -hmm. in Stanton. So, the transition was, well, I haven't done it before. I thought, let's give it a try. And 26 years later, I'm still teaching in those areas. But I have transitioned to uh, paying attention to what my colleagues are doing and paying attention to what the industry is like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I will be honest with people, it's a very difficult industry to break into now. And it mm -hmm. has changed so much, even in the last... 10 years, which we can get into. Yeah, I'm still yeah. working on uh, presenting and, and, and teaching uh, radio. That was the transition. Hadn't done it before. Let's try it. Okay. I love that. And so when, you know, obviously uh, <laughs> industry switching from uh, communications radio to educator, what was some of the grain, or, what was some of the growing or pain points when you first started teaching um, that you had to kind of adapt uh, the environment change or how you interact with people. You know, for instance, I'm pretty sure making a syllabus for the first time was difficult or something. I don't know. What were some pain points, some growing points as a, a new educator? Putting together lesson plans. Oh, I've got to do this again on Wednesday. Oh, I already did it from Monday. Oh, that was 75 minutes. I talk most of the time. I answer some questions. I got to do this again on Wednesday. I got to do this again for another three classes. Amazing. Well, it was it's a matter of uh, the transition was changing the focus to whatever I've learned, trying to apply it. Also keeping in mind that there we are, there is theory because in communication, that's what we study. Mm -hmm. We try to apply that in the situations. And I like to uh, put people in, uh, take them out of a comfort zone and place them into a situation where, yeah, you can't excel, but you've got to critically think of how this is going to uh, mm -hmm. help the situation. That's what I do a lot with my media management class. Uh, and uh, and that's that's a different animal because I'm not just concentrating on radio. I was trying, concentrating on all the different types mm -hmm. of uh, medium and platforms. And th well, the transition was to 
to be that teacher and to understand that uh, students, uh, my experience as an undergrad, it's not necessarily the mm -hmm. experience of a current undergrad because I had the four year rule get done in four years or you have to pay for it beyond that. Mm -hmm. Well, some of these students, I, I, that's another phrase I've often used. These students don't live to work. They work to live. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many try to cram in a 40 hour work week while taking a 12 or 15 credit load, sometimes 18 credits. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not wired like that, but uh, I have to think about that as well, but still mm -hmm. challenge them. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was, that was part of the transition to uh, challenge people to, critically analyze and critically think. So obviously, uh, you know, I'm pivoting. I'm just asking questions as we go along. But um, the game has changed. The, and when I say the game, radio has changed significantly since you started. And obviously, we're on a podcast right now. So that's a totally different lane. Um, I would have, I guess, a two-part question. Uh, maybe generally, how do you think radio has changed? And then the second part, or radio, whatever, podcasting. And two, how do you keep up? with this change, you know, staying in the know, how, like, how do you do that for yourself? I'll explain it from this point of view. How, why has radio changed from when I started in 94 as compared to now and mm -hmm. we're in a podcasting mode. That's because the, the viewer or the listener has control of the playlist. Mm -hmm. What I have to wait for my favorites. No, I can download it uh, from another platform and I can create my own mix. Uh, I, I don't like to listen to commercials. Okay, I'll pay this monthly fee so I can <laughs> avoid commercials. Mm -hmm. uh, once the technology caught up where the consumer has control of how, when, and where they want to mm -hmm. view or listen to their content, that's where the traditional or heritage media mm -hmm. had to scramble. Mm -hmm. I often think about these television networks. I saw a promo the other day for a show. And at the end, it says streaming tomorrow at whatever mm -hmm. the website is. Well, they know what you're doing. They, they know that we can still get you under the tent. But, but uh, we know that you may not want to wait until that Tuesday. Mm -hmm. But this is what's going to happen. The consumer has so much control of content uh, mm -hmm. uh a content uh, enjoyment, listening to mm -hmm. podcasts, watching content, that th this idea of, well, we control when you're going to listen to or watch, that's not there anymore. The only thing that can these stations, these heritage stations have that oh, technology does not is that it's very local mm. and you still have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. And maybe people don't want that. Okay, well, that's what the technology is there for, and they can be in their own little world. And the technology is there where they can control everything. But as far as I'm concerned, it, it still makes money. Mm -hmm. uh, at certain se segments, it still makes money. So as long as there is money going to somebody's pocket, that con content's going to be there. I'm still thinking that some of these television stations will go out of business. I was about to say, yeah. I I'm thinking some of these radio stations may go out of business because mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, bottom line is just too much. I think the tipping point has been COVID-19. Mm -hmm. What do I look at? I take a look at uh, all access and get reports on the industry. And one report had a whole list of different DJs who were let go mm -hmm. just in that week. And that was about a list of 100. I even know one who was let go after he was – in this industry before I was, he was in it when I was in high school and he was let go. Uh, corporatization of radio has now changed the game where we mm -hmm. do not need a position where I had in Stanton, Virginia, where I worked overnights. Mm -hmm. That job is done by Windows 10 <laughs> and whatever software you have programming. And you can make this sound so seamless as if somebody is there yeah. playing the music. So I do pay attention to all access. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one source. Uh, and I'm seeing even uh, public radio cutting back on positions, furloughing people, canceling shows. Yeah, uh, It is different. And that's what's led us into podcasts. One quick story about you know how we can yeah. make this sound so seamless. Uh, one of my uh, friends in uh, radio used to work at uh, Mix 107.3. Now she works at 92.5. 
Wink FM in Winchester. Her name is Cindy McGuire. But so she used to work at Mix 107.3 in DC. She talked about a story one time. She was working at a radio station in Martinsburg and she did middays. Well, they had the software, the technology at the time where she could come in on Thanksgiving morning and record all of her breaks, schedule mm. and make her sound like she was there. Next day on that Friday, somebody called the station, ca- talked to her and said, I was all alone on Thanksgiving Day and I appreciate you being there uh, because <laughs> yeah. I was glad somebody was there. Cindy did not tell her that that was all pre-recorded. Yeah. But that's where we have gotten to with technology and podcasting, as we'll get into, is almost like a different platform. Uh, and once again, it's uh, an ability of the consumer to control how, when, and where they want to consume this content. And on the flip side, it gives you the control of someone to have a stage. Like I love the fact that podcasting is like, I got an audience. I got my own control of the station. I don't need, if I wanted to talk about something, I could do it and I can blast it out. And I'm the control, I'm the boss of my podcast. So I love that. Right. Do, you th- do you think similar to, you know, just any technologies, like uh, for instance, um, we're not looking at, a- am- you know, a track radios or, you know, do you think it's going to completely absolutely out radio like it's going to be like completely gone or you think there's going to be like from 20 there's going to be like those last survivors of like one or two stations here and there like it's always going to be around no matter what just very rare or you think it's completely going to be absolutely you know completely taken out or you know I, I see radio in its corporate mode I'm seeing it already with newspapers where one media group owns maybe two or three newspapers in a region Mm-hmm. And they don't need three people to cover high school sports. No, we'll just have one cover that. So mm-hmm. we're seeing uh, media companies look at the bottom line and saying, we still need to produce mm-hmm. content, but with as few people as possible. Mm-hmm. We're already seeing that with radio. Maybe mm-hmm. we're looking at the day parts or the times of day that are going to be most profitable where we should have somebody in there. And that could be from 5 to 9 a.m. Uh, weekdays and 3 to 7 p.m. when we're going to work and coming home for work. But mm-hmm. we can have uh, automation run the middle of the day. We can make it sound as seamless and live as possible. And on weekends, well, we can just let that uh, roll. Uh, and with uh, automation uh, software and all of that. Uh, It's going to continue with that. Uh, But I'll go back to the point where if these media companies are turning a profit on these stations, they will continue on whatever uh, whatever that platform is to uh, produce content. That way, I don't want to say a budget, but a, Mm -hmm. a, uh, a business model that they're going to try and uh, uh, do to uh, raise revenue. But by the same token, radio is not the uh, investment that it was mm-hmm. 20 years ago. Okay, It's going to be very difficult. So, uh, but podcasting is, is changing how we're consuming content. Now it's a very personalized thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm looking at my smartphone and I've got 40 podcasts. I've got stuff from three years ago I haven't gotten to, yep. but yeah. it's going to be interesting to me. And if you can find a niche audience, uh, you can create a podcast. Now, can you make revenue off of that? If that's your goal, yeah. it's going to be very arduous and it's going mm-hmm. to take a while. Mm-hmm. And we know how the advertising works in podcasting. Yeah. Uh, and you have the host reading an ad and at the end, yeah. uh, Go to such and such site and use the keyword uh, yeah. Bridgeport or the, or the coupon and code. You get fifty yeah. percent off. You yeah. know, and now these companies know. Well, this advertising worked on this podcast, but it's not working mm-hmm. on this, so we're not going to spend as mm-hmm. much money. Uh, it, it, it's still something that the consumer wants; they love it. Yeah. But that's still going to be corporatization too. There may be some. There's we're getting into where there's many companies that produce podcasts, mm-hmm. uh, different types of. Uh, uh, subjects to appeal to different types of demographics. So that's where it's uh, heading to. Or are the, the big news where Joe, Joe Rogan changed the game where yeah. Spotify just paid them all out. And I guess they're obviously- They're paying for a name. They're yeah. paying for his audience too. Yeah, they're paying for his audience, but he built the brand on his own yeah. to eventually, as you said, corporate, corporatize it or sell it to something else. But, but then- but he, how, how did we know Joe Rogan before? He was in the traditional media. 
Exactly. So he's jumped yeah. to this digital platform yeah. and he's doing pretty well for himself. And some of these major media personalities can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, it, it, it usually, I think the money has to go to a higher corporation level, but still great to produce podcasts and be controlling of whatever content you want to create. That's, that's great. Do you encourage anyone, regardless if they want to be in front of the camera or a radio personality to be invested and learn how to make their own podcast on the side? The reason why I like to teach podcasts, I, I, I consider it more than an interview, but it's an art form. There has to be quality audio. I've heard podcasts where the audio is scratchy and I don't subscribe. I unsubscribe. <laughs> you cannot create something that is listenable. People are not going to come back to that. But then again, you have to make this uh, a subject that they just can't stop listening to. My rule of thumb has always been, and people like to violate rules, but I mean, that's <laughs> what the rules are there for to violate them. 20, 25 minutes. That's how long it takes you to drive to work or that's how much time you're going to spend on the treadmill exercising, or you're yeah. going to walk the dog in their neighborhood. Uh, and that, and then you can listen to a podcast in that time. If you go beyond that, you're probably going to have to have something that's quite interesting to have somebody constantly listen and then go back to it. Oh, well, uh, that, I broke that already. Cause this is going to be an hour long. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's my interview style. I was like, take it. I was like, well, uh, I already broke that rule, Roger. Um, I'm going to up in part two next week. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Coming up yes. in part five in five weeks. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I'm playing it for the long game, and I, honestly, I, you know, for me, particularly when I do a podcast, for me, this podcast is more about me just sharing my voice. I'd never thought about monetizing. I didn't go in it with that mindset, right. but I think I do agree that the best practice is I, I, for me, what I enjoy is different than what I produce, and so I, I do like those, those those podcasts in that window for myself mm -hmm. to listen to. But then sometimes I do hit the. I hit the hour long ones, um, but those have to be subjects and people that I really invested in. Um, but I, I it's still the listener too. The listener has to be invested too. Yeah. And you keep giving them content. You keep asking questions and they're totally interested in whatever the guest is or, and or the subject. And that's where podcasting is going to help. I think uh, because people will be invested. I've had podcasts to take an hour or two uh, mm -hmm. to listen to, but I'll keep listening. And yeah. uh, it's really good. Uh, and how the broadcast industry is uh, re reacting to this. They may be using shovelware where they take some content that they get from television and mm -hmm. put it in a podcast form. Some mm -hmm. days I'll, if I can't watch CBS this morning, yeah. uh, the first 15 minutes of news, uh, they have a podcast and I can listen to that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, the networks do know, okay, this is how you consume content. So we can give you that, but having original content, uh, that's what's going to attract uh, a bigger audience and things that are going to be interesting uh, that they're talking about. So one of the things that did pop up, you said best practices beyond, uh, you know, the 20 to 25 minute window and knowing your audience, um, you know, particularly some of the lessons you dropped in the class. One thing that was really helpful was more like also knowing your audience, right? And your niche. What would you encourage someone that's trying to be new into podcasting? How do they analyze one with their audiences or how do they analyze their niche? You know, for instance, I did it just by sticking to it no matter what and having every topic go back to it. Um, but now I'm going on the back end where I do look at my statistics and see who's really listening to my show. But that's like, that took me years to get to. Um, I wish I could have had some of these lessons that you taught before I started podcasting. I figured this out in the back end, but you know, for the new You're listener, excellent the way it is now, hang in there. Yeah. But how would you, how would you, for a new person before they even launched their show, rather than what I did backwards, how do they analyze their audience or their niche? What we've done in radio, we don't usually, uh, that, that has changed over time where we don't have, they, they still tried to program for, let's say 35 to 54 year olds or 18 mm -hmm. to 29 year olds but i have talked to friends in radio who now say well our audience member is 27 she has a master's degree she has a master's degree she's single she likes going to uh bars on friday she likes exercise classes on tuesday and thursday she likes knitting they've made a package of what that person is Mm -hmm. And they try and determine, and you can do research more and much better than ever, thanks to the internet. Mm -hmm. What does a 27 year old single female like to do mm -hmm. uh, what they like? And now you're going to present content for them. 
Mm-hmm. It, when you program for a 27 year old, it's not the same as that 54 year old mm-hmm. who uh, maybe, I don't know if more patient or mm-hmm. uh, likes to go into deeper discussions. Well, the 27 year old may want uh, a, a 30 minute podcast about, uh, about budgeting, mm-hmm. how to handle uh, a lack of loss of job within COVID-19 and how, and then that could be the mental aspects too, because mm-hmm. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm desperate to try and get back to work, but my mental thoughts are just not there. Well, mm-hmm. that's, if you think about what that 27 year old is going through right now, you will find guests and you will find topics mm-hmm. of interest to them. So the audience, uh, your target is always going to be, well, if you're, if you're producing a podcast just to throw it out for a, a general age group like teenagers or for 30 to 39 year olds, uh, well, that's fine. But you think about what would invest them. They, you're asking them to invest 20 to 60, maybe 70 minutes of their time mm-hmm. in something that you find extremely interesting. But how is that uh, interesting for that person? And maybe that's just my background. I like to think about others. Yeah. What they would be interested in. It, it's like, kind of a combination. Yeah, yeah I like you that. You think about you you are passionate about this subject. But what would make it pa- how do you make them mm. passionate about that? Have they brought this background where they're passionate about that? About politics, about mm. budgeting, about uh being a uh a, a socially conscious person. Mm-hmm. What if they've if they've brought that back? If you've already figured out this person is generally uh, a uh, a uh, somebody who is middle of the road political wise, who is looking for uh, a partner. It doesn't matter what gender. Mm-hmm. Uh, you think about that, and then you can tailor your content and programming to that and types of guests. So mm-hmm. yeah, you still think about who the end game and the end product. Who, what are, how are they, how do you want them to consume this too? Uh, mm-hmm. We have a 60 minute podcast. Well, that's fine. We'll have a 60 minute discussion, but uh, how do you, how do you want them to consume it as well? Mm-hmm. So you have to get into that mind and now yeah. you can do as much research as you can about whoever that person is and yeah. you will eventually, but you do have to promote this and thank goodness for Twitter and other places yeah. where you can promote this and you do have to promote it between others and eventually more people will figure out, Oh, this is where I can get this content and like, hashtag. We haven't yeah, even like, gotten the hashtags yet. I like that. I, I like that. I like one, two things is now I'm, I am as on the hindsight, I am starting to think about like imagining, imagining where my audience is listening to it and closing my eyes and picturing, Oh, maybe this is a person in their car or maybe this is this. Uh, I definitely also like to think of like who would be a content guest that I can get that would be interesting to new people and using that person's name to promote it. Like, this episode featuring and, and that would probably drive up some some traffic. But then I thought now more strategically, and I, I maybe touch upon this too, is consistency was key too. Knowing like people will expect a certain routine even in their own content. Like Philip drops a show on Mondays and Fridays. Um and I've over time it's taken me time to get to that point where I'm like, I know that I have to think about my audience's convenience, but my audience's expectations as well. Yeah. Um, what do they expect from me as a host? And so do they, you know, they get in new routines and they like to listen to it at a certain time and certain way. And they expect that. So yeah, I try to have that kind of transparency with listeners. Like if I need to take a break or I need to take season breaks to be very transparent with my audience. But it's like, now it's like, I didn't have that awareness at the very beginning of podcasting, but I think that is something that opens up that changes. You know, when you say, this content is consumable by anyone is now we have to kind of, to be ahead of the game, we have to think about that audience, like be mindful and presence, like how you talk and how you, what do you talk about? How do you interview? How do you, you know, make sure it's engaging. But I'm also thinking about this, not just engagement part, but like straight up structure, you know? Uh, and that's something I'd, I'd never thought about before until just more recently. Well, and people want consistency. They, they have that with weekday morning drive with radio Mm-hmm. They'll want consistency when you drop something. If you're going to have something every week, well, you better have something every week. Mm-hmm. And if there's going to be a time where you're going to let the listener know, I'm going to be uh, not producing because of X, Y, Z. Well, they'll mm-hmm. understand that, but maybe a highlights of previous podcasts. So mm-hmm. they'll still have something to download. You're still 
uh, in that area of where people are going to see this in their smartphone. Oh, here's another podcast that's dropped. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, well, this is new because of this. I'll keep listening. But if you're consistent in when you're going to drop content, uh, that's going to help too because people are looking for that. So um, now I got like one more question and then we'll go into my next segment which is called Shot for Shot. But for you, and you said uh, in regards to the commercialization and capitalization of podcasts, do you foresee Joe Rogan opening the door? And what, when do you predict more and more big names are going to get contracts like that? We're already seeing that right now. Um, who is the, uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to remember her name, but she's an actress on Mom. And uh, she's a longtime actress. So we're seeing personalities produce their own podcasts too. But the consistency has to be there as far as audience and companies uh, that uh, mass produce podcasts, they will take a look at downloads. They'll take a look at when people are consuming it. They'll take a look at the revenue that's been made. And, uh, and then it, it'll be determined whether or not people will do, continue listening to podcasts and whether or not they'll produce podcasts. But what I'm looking at is, the idea of, yeah, this is your chance to be creative. Uh, you really don't need a lot of money to produce a podcast. I mean, uh, we're in a digital environment right here, but you can make this sound like I'm, I'm only uh, six feet social distancing away from you uh, and, uh, and make it sound like an interesting conversation. Uh, the art form is making it sound uh, listenable uh, with quality audio. And it doesn't cost all that much to produce uh, something with quality audio too. So people are going to create that. Uh, it's going to have to be where one person hears about it and recommends another person who recommends another person who recommends another person because there's also a uh, the podcast host and producer has uh, pro uh, promoted this to a point where, well, maybe somebody I'll take a look at. But the, 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 the upteen number of podcasts, it's very difficult out there to break through. Uh, so mm -hmm. you do have to uh, provide content interviews uh, that people will want to uh, enjoy. And don't forget about the audio quality uh, and the consistency. But this is an exciting moment uh, where people mm -hmm. get to be creative and get their point of view across. Whereas uh, 10, 15 years ago, this was a stretch. Mm -hmm. and now uh, it does not have to be a major movie star that does interviews with fellow movie stars. It can be something where uh, something within a neighborhood of people can be uh, producing something. I love it. Well, we're going to the part of our show called Shot for Shot. This is a surprise. I didn't tell you we was going to do this. But Shot for Shot is an opportunity where you get to ask any random question you want, and I get to ask any random question I want, whether it's related to this topic or not. Uh, 56. Do you want to <laughs> oh no we're not gonna talk about age okay okay what what was uh yeah. so <laughs> do you want to go first i'll go first all right favorite dorm you lived in at james madison so surprise um i didn't live on campus at all oh. uh so i uh went to Bowie state first on a track scholarship nice went, lived there for two years and then treated it like a community college and transferred so when i transferred to jmu i, I went straight off campus and i lived in ashby apartments so okay. I didn't get a chance to live that life. But my wife, she went to JMU all four years. And so I would visit her quite frequently in Weaver. Okay. So I guess that's going to be my that. favorite. That'd be my favorite because I, was, I, would, I would stay there. Supposedly, you know, I, I'm, I'm an adult now, so I can say this. My parents were like super strict, you know, about like, uh, you know, staying with girls over, you know, overnight, like really religious, whatever. And so they were like, Yo, when you're going out, who are you visiting at JMU? And I say, yo, I'm visiting Maggie, but I, uh, like, who are you staying with? And I say, I'm staying with my boy, Kelly Sharbel. But no, I was shacking up. So I was shacking up in Weaver. <laughs> <laughs> I should have reported you to the head resident. Hey, surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, we got married, though. So Okay, great. Uh, we went backwards. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, let's stick to the topic of JMU. Um particularly you decided to go there for, for college, uh, not too far down 81. Was there any aspirations to go somewhere other than JMU in your undergrad? And then the fact that you went, what was one of your favorite student experiences at JMU that really like 
because you didn't decide to go somewhere else, you went to JMU. That's, that really affirmed that you made the right choice to go to JMU. I was going to, I was accepted at Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. I was going to study transportation or civil engineering. Mm -hmm. I took physics and mechanical drawing my senior year in high school. <laughs> okay. I nearly failed. Yeah. Mechanical drawing. I can't see things in three dimensions. I'm not going to be able to handle all this science at Virginia Tech. It's a great school. I loved it. But I probably would have noticed that they have a TV studio and a radio studio, and I would have changed it to mass comp. And yeah. maybe uh, having Hoda Kotb in one of my classes, I could have bragged about that because she graduated at Tech about the same time I graduated from JMU. But um, well, I think the experiences of making lifelong friends, but I think the best part, my favorite story, I did live in Bell Hall my senior year, mm -hmm. and I would wear earplugs to bed because I didn't want to bother people blasting their stereos at midnight when I was trying to sleep. I woke up at 3 one morning to see my roommate come from outside the hallway, and I go, why are you awake? He goes, well, we had a fire drill. I go, well, why didn't you wake me up? You were <laughs> left me here. I couldn't hear the fire drill because I had earplugs. And why did you wake me up? So that's uh, the, one of my favorite stories of the <laughs> But uh, you lived. The good thing was, a, was it a drill, not a real fire, right? Oh, it was, no, it was, no, it was a drill, but I mean, <laughs> I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. Yeah. I didn't hear it. But uh, no, I, I think uh, the uh, friendships I've made, that's what's uh, been great. I've enjoyed some great uh, classes. Uh, God bless Dr. Turner, wherever he is these days. I uh, hope he's doing well. One of my favorite instructors. And I, I think that's what I enjoyed most. So, I mean, it's great. And I have definitely some shared memories. And I think some of the shared memories that I would say about Jamie is the same things that you said was more my student experience. I definitely kept in touch with a few professors. Mm -hmm. And that was good to build relationships with them. And I still stay with, in touch with them to this day. And that student involvement, getting involved in student orgs really kind of kept me plugged in and happy at JMU. Um, so we're at the part of the show. Um, this is it. We're, we're at the tail end. Uh, shout outs and plugs. So with that, you can shout out anyone, your mom, your, you know, or your wife or your students that you, you know, want to show some love to. And then plugs, anything that you would want the listeners to follow up with and, and <laughs> follow up with you. That's the and, plugs I need right yeah, now. Yeah, the hair plugs. But any way that you want the people to follow up um, and communicate, whether it's social media handles or websites or anything to follow up what you're doing. So stage is set, floor is yours. I'll be quiet. Shout out some plugs. Shout out to my wife. We celebrated our 28th wedding anniversary on Saturday. Uh, the secret to a good marriage, uh, you marry your best friend and uh, you are always there for them, even if it maybe inconvenience you. Um, okay, so so shout out, and what else do I get? I'm sorry, what else? Plugs, anything you want the Plugs. listeners to uh, follow up with you, you know, or follow up with anything that you're doing, or Mason as well, too. Okay, well, uh, I would encourage people to go to wgmuradio.com. We do play uh, music, what we call emerging artists. Uh, uh, it's the College radio is still the location for... Uh, future stars. Years and years ago, we were overplaying this song by a group called The Killers. Uh, somebody told me. Yeah. And six months later, they became a household name. Uh, there are a whole host of different artists that have started in college radio and appealed to that audience and eventually became commercial success. So college radio uh, is something I would encourage you to listen to. And WGMURadio.com because we carry Mason basketball and we've got some dedicated show producers and it's not just uh, music. It can be talk shows. It can be a different genre of uh, music. So I encourage you to uh, uh, do that. And as far as uh, journalism, I do like to follow stories, but I do like to go to allsides.com. It's amazing. I will look at a new story and see three different perspectives of the same story. And that just goes out to show, wow, uh, there can be some perspective that can be brought into journalism. So I do like to just peruse that and see uh, that. Uh, but uh, some other plugs, I would encourage you to go to studentmedia.gmu.edu. Mm -hmm. It's not just WGMU, it's Mason Cable Network, which produces everything from cooking shows to sports talk shows. We have the fourth estate where uh, even in the summer we're covering uh, uh, issues related to what's happening in society and with COVID-19. Uh, we also have a whole host of different types of journals uh, where you can contribute uh, 
pieces that you've written for your class, or if you like to have different types of uh, 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 like art, or you like to have different types of uh, uh, short stories, you can contribute to that. What else am I looking at here? Mason Cable Network, WGMU. We have a live stream and we produce mm -hmm. a whole host of different types of Mason sports events, live coverage. That's always good. Shout out to Catherine Mangus, our student media director, who does an incredible amount of work and is an advocate, not only for the students, but for student media as a whole. Mm -hmm. And we need to have uh, her recognized, along with my staff members, which would be Ben and David and Jason at Student Media, who are leading these terrific uh, organizations, student-led, uh, and we're seeing students producing content that they can call their own and they can point to it with pride. Even if they would make it something that would attack to a re attach to a resume, mm -hmm. uh, it's still something that says, yes, I did this. And uh, it demonstrates that you have that creative bone and that you'll be recognized for it. So uh, recognize that, recognize a uh, shout out to the Department of Communication who uh, is still giving us a chance to uh, prove that there's a world beyond STEM. There's nothing wrong with STEM, okay? Yeah. Nothing wrong with STEM, but let's put an A in there and make it STEEAM. All right. That's right. I'm down. Uh, That's what I was about to say. I was just about to say STEAM, man. Show some love. <laughs> uh, it you is can, not you, just you, STEM. And you, can, and you can throw, with the STEAM, you can incorporate technology artistically. So, yes. you know, definitely build up your skills. If you want to be artistic, just learn how to use software to be artistic. You know what I'm saying? So. Yes. So you still can be creative. So STEAM, I'm definitely team STEAM right here. Okay. Shout out to that. And my final shout out is to a uh, dude named uh, Philip uh, Wilkerson, who uh, is uh, not only a uh, colleague now and uh, not only a famous alum, but somebody who cares about students. And uh, he's 10 feet tall. And <laughs> we need, uh, not, not literally, but uh, he's 10 feet tall because we look up to him and we need more of him. I appreciate it. Well, shout out to that. You know, I wish I was really taller because I'm really short. But um, in regards to your plugs, definitely, definitely check out Student Media. I would say I actually do it myself. I subscribe to the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And it's just funny just to stay plugged in and see how the student, students think. I, I watch their content. Um, I watch Cody's show. Uh, you know, he had his little you know, late night news show. Uh, uh, it was uh, Angelique. You know, she was doing big things. And she's still doing big things. Um, Angelique that's now working, um, doing uh, news coverage down in Bristol, I believe. Bristol, Tennessee, yeah. Bristol, Tennessee. So it's, it's really cool to see the students, as you said, own their own content and create it. And as a big proponent at the Career Center, I always tell people when I work with students, not only are, you know, what are you doing internships and clubs, but are you actually creating content? And so I, I literally push those students to student media, say, if you want to get into journalism, you, please write, write for, 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 submit an article for Forfa State. Or if you want to do this, please do this. Or if you want to be a video producer, make videos. Because as we know, a stagnant resume is not going to cut it no more. You need to have a resume and you need to have tangible, proven uh, uh, create, uh, content to show employers, I know how to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so, and there, you know, now we got a new thing. Shout out to Team Steam. <laughs> you know, like, we gotta we gotta get people to be more involved and think about how you express yourself in the arts, but also using utilizing technology as technology changes to still keep up with that technology, but still not get give away that creative you know spirit that you have to to express yourself in new ways. You know, so you can still be an artist, but yeah. also be an artist that is very digitally savvy. You know, kind of combining that. Um, there are no entry level positions out there. The working world actually ex expects you to have some sort of experience. And yeah. this is where you can do your entry level work. Exactly. You know, they're going to say, when you graduate, do you already have experience using X, Y, and Z software? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, student media is a great opportunity to get that opportunity, that hands on experience. Because, you know, you're on campus, you're there, they're there. It's, it's a match made in heaven. Um, so, Please, please, please follow up with all these resources. Follow up with all the radio. Please follow up with the student media website. Get involved. Get uh, Use your voice. Use your talents to get this work, get this uh, hands-on uh, hands experience right now. If you have any questions for the show, you can call the hotline, which is 571-336-6560. That's 571-336-6560. Roger, it's been a pleasure having you on my show. Uh, you, you gave me a shout-out, but you're – 
if I'm 10 feet tall, you're 10 feet with one inch, you're a little bit higher than me. Uh, so uh, I look up to you too and all the things you're doing and all the time and, and work you put into the community and to the students. Uh, that is something I aspire to do with my career um, when it's all said and done. So thank you so much for being on the show. Please check it out. Please follow up. Please share this episode with your family and friends and we're out. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.